Roger, Roger, 595. Roger, Roger, 73. Well, my apologies for the delay in starting up tonight, some technical issues, but I think we've got them uh, worked out. Uh, no technical issues with the presentation, uh, hopefully, that need to be uh, changed. But uh, happy to have you here uh, to begin Chapter 9 with antennas. Uh, we'll do the first two sections of Chapter 9 tonight. Uh, and I have uh, some extra material that's not necessarily test-related, uh, but just want to give you some concepts and some ideas about uh, certain things and hopefully we can get out of here early tonight. First, are there any questions on any of the material we've covered so far? All right, let's get going. Get my little clicker here. And I'd like to start with an impedance review. Uh, and if you remember that impedance is the opposition to AC current flow, it's made up of a resistance and a reactance. It can be an inductive reactance or it could be a capacitive reactance. And we can uh, write that down in a complex notation either with uh, the real resistance part plus J reactance. Uh, that's a rectangular notation. Or we can write it uh, in a, a polar notation where we have a magnitude and a phase angle. Um, so that's a, a complex way of uh, expressing impedance. So anybody remember what this might be? That's Ohm's law, E over I, R. And I just want to point out that Ohm's law to a certain extent also works for impedance. And so I'm going to make reference to Ohm's law for impedance now. The fine print at the bottom here says that you have to express uh, the impedance in a complex form, either rectangular or, or uh, scalar, um, 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 with, a, with an angle. Scalar is uh, magnitude only. I had to look that up. I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> but um, by and large, you can use Ohm's law with impedance. The point I want to make tonight is just an illustration of a concept. We're not going to go into calculations. We're not going to do any math. Um, but I want you to start thinking about impedance as the ratio uh, of voltage to current in a circuit. Why is that important? Well, have you ever wondered when you've got a tube type device and there will be warning signs all around it that say, warning, high voltage. And you don't generally see those same notifications on solid state devices. Well. Tubes are high impedance devices. Semiconductor devices are low impedance devices. And so the ratios of voltage to current in each of those are different. Uh, you have a higher voltage to current ratio in, in tube type equipment. You have a lower voltage to current ratio in solid state equipment. Um, and the ratio of volts and amps in a 50 ohm circuit can be calculated. Um, so uh, if you've got a 50 ohm dummy load, let's say for example, and we know we've got one amp of radio frequency current flowing into that dummy load, well the voltage across that dummy load is going to be, via Ohm's law, 50 volts. And since it's pure resistance in a dummy load, you don't have to even uh, worry about the reactance portion of it. So, uh, for a 50 ohm load or 50 ohm circuit, you can expect with a one amp of current, you're going to have about 50 volts in that circuit. Now, what about in a 600 ohm circuit? There are some 600 ohm uh, open wire transmission lines. Well, if there, if um, uh, you have uh, one amp of current flowing, you're going to have 600 volts happening uh, in that circuit. Again, we're just looking at the ratio of voltage to current and trying to equate that to impedance. There are no test questions on this. This is just a concept that I'm trying to get across to you. When you hear impedance in radio frequency circuits, start to think about voltage to current ratios. 
And in a 50 ohm signal generator like this one, for example, they will maybe have a build out resistor inside that's 50 ohms so that it matches uh, a 50 ohm load on the output. Um, but really, the generator, instead of generating one volt, it's actually generating two. It's losing half of it in the generator. And again, transmission lines have different characteristic impedances. Open wire transmission lines are going to have higher voltages on them, uh, which is one of the reasons why they have lower losses per 100 foot, because they're operating at higher voltages. Same uh, distinction with a high voltage transmission line for power. That's why they use high voltage, because they'll have lower losses uh, over distance. All right. I'm going to promise you some special treats not to eat. Uh, at the end of this, uh, some video links uh, that will go uh, further in explaining certain concepts uh, using pictures. And if you're like me, I, I like images. I like pictures to, to you know, let me see what's going on. I've got some, some videos that have some animation that are just out of this world. So stand by for that. So let's get started on section 9.1. Okay, now we can put our test hats back on. And here's our old friend, the isotropic radiator. Uh, this is a point source antenna. Uh, it can't be built on Earth, even in space. The problem is reflections. So it's a theoretical antenna, but uh, it radiates equally well in all directions. That's an isotropic radiator. So if you had a dipole out in free space, uh, and the dipole is the, the red line uh, you see in there. This is the radiation pattern from the dipole. It's kind of egg-shaped. Again, because you're out in free space, there are no reflections. So this is, this is how it would look. Well, when you bring it, uh, well, let's first take a look here. The dipole in a certain direction can have upwards of 2.15 dB of gain over the isotropic radiator. So if you've got a dipole antenna, it already has 2.15 dB more signal in a certain direction than an isotropic radiator would have. So do manufacturers compare their antennas to dipoles? No. They compare their antennas to the isotropic radiator because it makes their marketing specifications look 2.15 dB higher. But be aware of that. All right. So here's where I was going with the dipole antenna when you add the earth. That egg shape that we looked at before flattens out. That's because of reflections coming back up from the earth and reflections coming down from the ionosphere. And so this is a realistic look at a pattern for an earth-based dipole antenna. And you can see uh, the drawings on the, the center, uh, the bottom there, that's looking down. Uh, on the dipole, and then there's an elevation chart there to the right as well. All right, this is the most important slide as far as I'm concerned in this entire presentation. Uh, and this was uh, pointed uh, out to me by my Elmer, Bill, N4IQ. We were having a comment about dipole antennas, and I was going on, well, should I shorten the antenna? Should I lengthen the antenna? Because I'm, you know, you you want to have the, the dipole resonant on the right frequency and have a good match. And Bill, who's been around this game for a long time, said, Gary, it's probably not so important. What do you mean? What's probably more important is how high the antenna is. And so what this chart is showing you, uh, the vertical axis is height above, uh, excuse me, um, is resistance in ohms, the impedance of the antenna in ohms, and the horizontal is the height in wavelengths above ground. And you notice it with the starting point in the lower left-hand corner, it starts out at pretty low impedance, 10 ohms, and as you raise the antenna above the earth, you'll see that um, at a point about a quarter of a wavelength off, and it looks to be about 73 ohms, that's what we say the nominal impedance, center impedance of a center-fed dipole is. Well, notice if you raise it up even more, though, the impedance of that antenna is going to go up even higher, up to like 100. And then you uh, go even higher, and it starts coming back down. And you notice that that 
uh, undulating pattern is actually regressing to a mean. It's actually coming to a, an average, and the average is what we say the center point impedance of a half wave dipole is 73 ohms. But for you, where you're not likely going to have your antenna you know, multiple wavelengths up, uh, especially for low band dipoles like 80 meters or 160, you may find that for impedance matching purposes, that it makes much more sense to change the height of the dipole than it does actually to worry about cutting it to exact lengths. You can actually maybe change and get a better match just by raising or lowering the dipole antenna. So I'd like you to just consider that. So here's a trick question. How does the total amount of radiation emitted by a directional gain antenna, let's say a dipole, uh, compare with the total amount of radiation emitted from an isotropic antenna, assuming that each is driven by the same amount of power? Total amount of radiation is exactly the same. It just goes in slightly different directions. The isotropic it goes in a thoroughly op omnidirectional uh, pattern, whereas with a dipole or a gain antenna, that same energy is squeezed into a different uh, pattern. And so in a certain direction you might have gain, but in another direction you might have no coverage whatsoever. Directional antennas, as they're building their directionality, as they're using the elements of the antenna to, to build gain, um, they have what is known as a near field and far field. As um, the, the waves are interacting with each other in the near field, they're not directional. They're very kind of jumbled. Um, whereas farther away from the antenna, at some point a pattern will develop and that is then the stable pattern of the antenna from that point uh, on out. Um, this is a, a nice diagram from uh, Dave Kassler in his video, and uh, so I stole it. The dipole is uh, horizontal here, and we remember that a dipole antenna, the signal is strongest broadside to the antenna. So you can see here the interference patterns, and where it's white, those are the reinforcing interference patterns, and so that's where the directionality uh, of the antenna comes from. That area in the very center of the antenna is kind of jumbled. That's the near field. That's where the, the pattern hasn't fully developed yet. Antenna feed point impedance. You may have an antenna analyzer like this one. Uh, various factors. We already looked at antenna height and how that can affect it. The conductor length, that is a factor, so shortening or, or lengthening the antenna can change the feed point impedance. The conductor diameter. Thinner diameter wires will have a narrower uh, bandwidth uh, and can impact the impedance that you're trying to achieve. And conductive objects that are nearby can also change uh, the uh, feed point impedance of an antenna. I talked about the, the diameter of the wire. Um, and the larger diameter you can make the, the radiating elements, the, the wider the bandwidth. We talked about that. Uh, and that's why cage dipoles are sometimes used to cover a, a lot of area. The bandwidth of an antenna is also known as the antenna's Q. And the diagrams that you see here are um, diagrams for a 20 meter dipole on the left, like you might put in your backyard. And you can see there that the, the standing wave ratio bandwidth, or SWR bandwidth, covers almost the entire 20 meter band. That's great. That, that's indicative of a lower Q antenna, low Q. Whereas the antenna on the right hand side with the chart, um, that might be like a, a 20 meter ham stick antenna that you might put on your car. Well, that's also for 20 meters. But notice how narrow the SWR bandwidth is. That's because that antenna is a high Q antenna. And so it's only going to be working on limited frequency ranges. So if you've got a free favorite frequency that you want to work, that's where you want to tune the antenna. And the antenna's bandwidth, when uh, an antenna is uh, too short, it is said to be capacitive. 
when an antenna is too long, it is said to be inductive or to work in another way. Um, if you're below the resonant frequency of that antenna, then you have a, a capacitive um, uh, measurement of, uh, of impedance. And if you go above the, the resonant frequency of the antenna, you have an inductive measurement of, of impedance. Uh, where you can get uh, a useful match, that's considered the antenna's SWR bandwidth. And, and you set the criteria. If your receiver will only work, or transceiver will only work over a two to one bandwidth, then that's the criteria you're looking for, is what's my two to one bandwidth SWR uh, range. Um, if it's three to one, well, you, you've got something else. So you set that criteria. Antenna system impedance is made up of these four factors. Inductive reactance, that's the plus J. Ohmic resistance, which I'll get to in just a second. Radiation resistance, that's the resistance, that's the good resistance of an antenna. That's the resistance that's doing work, that's actually transferring energy out uh, into space. And then uh, capacitive reactance. So let me go back to ohmic resistance. You want to keep bad connections or um, corrosion or things like that as low as possible because that's ohmic resistance. And if your ohmic resistance starts coming up, then you're going to be heating the wires or heating the connection as opposed to radiating power. So you want to have the radiation resistance uh, as high as possible. And an antenna's efficiency uh, is considered to be the radiation resistance over the total system resistance. So uh, if you've only got radiation resistance, then your efficiency is 1 or 100%. And radiation resistance, the definition, uh, is that value of resistance that would dissipate the same amount of power as that radiated from your antenna. And again, here we have a look at an antenna system, uh, especially vertical antennas uh, that you're like on a vehicle, for example, uh, if you go take a look at my avalanche down there and you, you see the, uh, the antenna mount, you see a really thick copper braid going off from the, the ground side of the antenna to the chassis of the car. I'm trying to reduce ohmic uh, losses at that point uh, so that uh, I can make sure that the, the maximum amount of radiation uh, is taking place. For Ground-mounted vertical antennas, what comes into play uh, are radials, ground radials. And these are lengths of wire that either lay on the surface of the ground or even underneath the ground. Uh, quarter wavelength, third wavelength, it all depends on what kind of room you've got. Um, you can buy from DX Engineering this uh, radial mount you see there on the left. Uh, and so. 64 different uh, radials, I think, uh, will connect to that. Uh, and there are hams in this area. I'm thinking of Dave Anderson, K4SV, who have radial fields that have that many radials out. Um, and that um, will improve the antenna's efficiency by having a large number of uh, radials. Oh, there's ground strap over there on the right. Remember, ground strap, because of its surface area, uh, is the best conductor of radio frequency uh, current. But Gary, can, can't I just use a ground rod uh, for my vertical antenna? Well, I did this as a novice, not knowing any better back in, in the 1960s. I think we have mice work, walking on the roof. Um, but no, for radio frequency energy for uh, a vertical antenna, ground rods are fine for lightning protection. Uh, fine for signal uh, grounds for reception, but for um, a vertical, quarter wave vertical antenna, you need a radial ground field. Um, I liken it to the ground serves um, as where you can push off, uh, where the signal can push off uh, to be radiated, like if you were in a swimming pool and you, you want to push off from the side of the pool. Well, that's fine, but if you've got nothing to push off against, you're not going to go anyplace. So that's, that's where the ground radials come into play. 
Vertical antennas work best over salt water, not fresh water, salt water, which is why you'll see when the expeditions go to a lot of tropical islands or whatnot, they'll set up their antennas right at the water's edge uh, and run radials right out even into the water. Um, so, uh, and you can see by the uh, elevation pattern here uh, that over salt water, that antenna has quite a bit of additional gain uh, versus over ground. So that is the best case scenario for a vertical antenna. All right, I got some bad news for you. Soil conductivity is also a factor. Uh, and in some states, the soil conductivity is really good. In other states, it's really bad. Welcome to South Carolina, where it's a really bad. Um, so here's a soil conductivity map. Uh, darker is better. Uh, and we're not the worst, but we're not great. Uh, and so uh, the soil does not help us as much as other, in other locations. Uh, so more radials are probably needed here uh, than in some other locations. And verticals over poor ground, here's the kind of radiation pattern you would see. We're looking at an uh, elevation uh, angle map here uh, where um, a perfect ground you know, goes out a long distance. The very poor ground vertical antennas uh, don't radiate with anywhere near the same signal strength. So we talked about uh, the isotropic radiator. We said that a dipole antenna has a 2.15 dB gain over a dipole. So here are specifications that a manufacturer can state that their antenna has either dBi, gain over an isotropic, or dBd, gain over a dipole. And you'll actually, in the QST ads, you'll actually see that uh, for the antennas. So you don't get something for nothing. And so the higher gain that an antenna will have, the narrower beam width that it will also have. So it means you're going to have to be moving that antenna more. Uh, so uh, the top, for example, might be a four or five element Yagi antenna uh, that's uh, pointed off in a particular direction. The bottom might be a two element hex beam, uh, which has less gain, less str you know, strength in that particular direction, but a broader uh, beam width, which for contesting may be perfectly fine. You don't have to turn the antenna as often. And you'll see polar plots like this, uh, and you'll get test questions that'll ask you, well, what is the 3 dB beam width? And so I brought my uh, ham radio pointer. So notice the dB scales here on the vertical axis. And 0 dB is at the outer ring, 3 dB is the next ring down, and so you this is the reference point, and you follow until you cross the 3 dB line. See where that is right there? And do it in the other direction, and right there. And you calculate how wide that beam width is at that point. And so um, approximately 50 degrees, in this case, would be the 3 dB beam width of this particular antenna. Everybody see how I got that? So front to back ratio, this can be calculated as well. Um, and you use the, the dB scale. Uh, and so here's the reference line, the outer. And this is the front. And the back here, well, how far down is that? Let's we'll see. Da, 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 there's the minus 12 dB ring. Uh, and there's the minus 24. So it's somewhere in between minus 12 and minus 24. Let's say about 18 dB difference between the front to back. That's the front to back ratio. So what do we call this? This is an elevation view. So we're looking at uh, the antenna and, and how it is sending its signal up to the uh, ionosphere. And this antenna, like many antennas, has more than one lobe but it has a main lobe. 
and that's the one that gives you the strongest signal. So this is the main lobe of this antenna. Uh, and about what um, angle of radiation would that main lobe be? We see there's, there's 30 degrees. So that'd be half of that, that'd be 15 degrees, and that's about half of that, or maybe about seven and a half degrees. Now it is radiating in the other directions as well, but in this case you would say that the main lobe radiation is at seven and a half degrees above vertical, or above, above the horizon, I should say. And how many lobes are there? Forward lobes? Four, Four exactly. And can you calculate the front to back ratio from this graph? Yes. So as long as the main lobe is on the, the 0 dB line, you can go and take a look uh, and you need to use the scale, uh, the minus 30 dB line, it's not quite down there. So we'd estimate a 28 dB, 30 dB, something like that, front to back ratio. See how we did that? And a front to side ratio can also be calculated. This is a, a polar plot looking down uh, on the antenna. And as long as that main lobe is on the 0 dB line, then you can go to the side, uh, either top or bottom on this uh, diagram, and do a calculation. It's uh, a little bit more than minus 12, so maybe eh, 14, minus 14. So 0 to minus 14, 14 dB front to side ratio. And uh, the elevation angle of the peak lobe on this one, well, we looked at it before. This is seven and a half degrees. We already did this one. So I want to introduce you to some software that's available to you if you buy the American Radio Relay League's antenna handbook, uh, the most uh, current uh, version. Uh, it usually comes with a CD that you can uh, then install this software. And this is called High Frequency Terrain Analysis. And what it does is it compares using uh, topographical map data that is, is stored uh, online. Uh, it compares your location, the terrain around your location, with that of flat ground, say Kansas. And terrain where your station is located can be, be either beneficial or it can work against you. And so what high frequency terrain analysis does is it models your location and um, for example, with a, a flat antenna, that's the red, uh, an antenna over flat ground, um, signals below two degrees would hardly be received at all. So in Kansas, really low angle radiation wouldn't, whereas at this particular location, um, there's a peak right about there, so uh, very low angle signals would be enhanced at this location. And I can talk you through how to do this for your actual location. You can go to Google Earth, uh, get your uh, longitude and latitude uh, for where your station would be. Uh, you can download the topographical information from a, a ham in California who's got a server that does nothing but this. Uh, and put all the data together. And what they're not showing you here on this is uh, there's a statistical analysis over the last 11 years of signals coming from particular locations, say Europe, and they tell you how often signals come in at low angles of radiation and how often signals come in at high angles of radiation. And you can do a kind of a quality analysis of, well, is my location going to be good or bad? There are some hams who have actually bought their properties based on this. And there's one of them locally. I'll tell you later who. <laughs> so consider this, a dipole on a hillside where the hill is f falling away, sloping downward toward your target location. You will get enhanced propagation in that direction because of that, which is why then hams always like to be on the top of a mountain, because there's falling terrain close to their antenna and they get additional gain. And that's documented in the HFTA analysis. The height of your antenna, 
if you mount your tri-bander really low down to your roof, you're going to get a very high angle of radiation. Whereas if you can get your tri-bander up higher, the angle of radiation will come down lower and generally give you better uh, reception and transmission to DX stations. So the height of the antenna has an impact on the elevation angle. All right, let's answer some questions. So what describes an isotropic antenna? It's a theoretical antenna. We can't build it, but it's used as a reference. And what antenna has no gain in any direction? Again, the isotropic antenna. And which of the following factors may affect the feed point impedance of an antenna? Multiple answers all contained in, in B, correct. And what is included in the total resistance of an antenna system? They're not talking about reactances here, they didn't really, but radiation resistance plus ohmic resistance. That makes up the resistance of the antenna, and you want to keep ohmic resistance as low as possible. It's good, solid connections. And how does the beam width of an antenna vary as the gain is increased? As gain increases, beam width will decrease. And what is meant by antenna gain? The ratio of the radiated signal strength in a direction that you specify compared to that of a reference antenna, which could be an isotropic antenna or could be a dipole. Those are the, the two most common. And what is meant by antenna bandwidth? Remember I said that you could determine what is good for you. What standing wave ratio, for example, will your transceiver uh, allow you to operate? So it's a frequency range over which an antenna satisfies a performance requirement that you specify. And how is antenna efficiency calculated? And the whole point is you want the good resistance. And the good resistance is radiation resistance. So radiation resistance over the total resistance times 100% will give you the antenna's efficiency in percent. So 1 over 1 would be 100% efficient. So which of the following choices is a way to improve the efficiency of a ground-mounted quarter-wave vertical antenna? To improve the efficiency, you want to install a good radial system for a vertical antenna. And which of the following factors determines ground losses for a ground-mounted vertical antenna operating in the HF range? That's soil conductivity, and I didn't specify the ground losses, but um, that's what happens when you have poor conductivity, you, you lose energy, uh, whereas it's uh, not the case when you have a really good soil conductivity. All right, how much gain does an antenna have compared to a half wavelength dipole when it has 6 dB gain over an isotropic? So how did you get there? 6 dB minus 2.15, which is, and so that gets you to 3.85. And how much gain does an antenna have compared to a half wave dipole when it has 12 dB gain over an isotropic? 9.85 in this case, yeah. And what is meant by the radiation resistance of an antenna? Uh, 
the value of a resistance that would dissipate the same amount of power as that radiated from the antenna. Correct. All right, get your glasses on, look closely. In this uh, antenna radiation pattern, what is the 3 dB beam width? Or can you remember? It's 50 degrees, correct. 25 on one side and 25 on the other. And what is the front to back ratio? It looks like it's about 18 dB. It's a little bit um, greater than the minus 24 ring and a little bit uh, less than the, the minus 12 ring, so 18 dB, someplace in there. And what is the front to side ratio? Yep, 14 dB between the minus 12 and the minus 24, so you can approximate it that way. All right, and what type of antenna pattern over real ground is shown? This is an elevation pattern. And what is the elevation angle of peak response? So you see there's the 30 degree mark, half of that is 15 degrees, half of that would be about seven and a half, so that's where it's sitting, so seven and a half. And how does the total amount of radiation emitted by a directional gain antenna compare with the total amount of radiation emitted from an isotropic antenna, assuming each is driven by the same amount of power? They are the same. And how can the approximate beam width in a given plane of a directional antenna be determined? It's generally recognized as the 3 dB points, the half power points. So you find those and then you cal calculate the angles. And what is the far field of an antenna? It's where the antenna has developed its radiation pattern shape. Uh, and it's then independent of distance. Even as you move further out, it stays, you know, the same. All right, let's look again. What is the front to back ratio of this antenna? It's not quite minus 30, so yet we're going to say 28 dB. See where the 30 dB ring is there? And see in the back, backward, there, those little peaks are a little bit more than that, so. And how many elevation lobes appear in the forward direction? There's four of them. And how is the far field elevation pattern of a vertically polarized antenna affected by being mounted over seawater versus rocky ground? What it's going to do is it's going to take the angle of radiation and bring it down so the low angle radiation increases and you'll get out farther. And what is the main effect of placing a vertical antenna over an imperfect ground? The contrary, it reduces the low angle radiation. It actually makes the antenna radiate higher. And how does the performance of a horizontally polarized antenna mounted on the side of a hill compare with the same antenna mounted on flat ground? The main lobe takeoff angle decreases in the downhill direction, so it hits the ionosphere lower and will actually go out farther. And how does the radiation pattern of a horizontally polarized three element beam vary with its height above ground? The main lobe takeoff angle will, as you raise the antenna, it will decrease. Again, giving you 
greater distance. And what happens is the Q of an antenna increases. If Q increases, SWR bandwidth will decrease. This is the hamstick antenna on a, a mobile vehicle. And which of the following types of conductor would be best for minimizing losses in a station's RF ground system? This was the gratuitous picture of flat copper strap. <laughs> And which of the following would provide the best RF ground for your station? Out of these choices, yes, an electrically short connection to three or four interconnected ground routes driven into the earth. That is an RF ground. It's not the same as a ground, though, for a vertical antenna. All right, let's take five minutes. All right, let's get started, and hopefully we can get you out here uh, a little early tonight. So uh, section 9.2, practical antennas. But first, more important than the type of antenna that you select for your ham station, and I alluded to this earlier, more important than the, the type of antenna that you select is the location of the station. So um, if you can, you know, find a good location, um, that will actually uh, help you more than anything else. And one of the things we talked about with location is terrain. The other thing to be aware of is radio frequency noise and interference. And this is something, uh, some knowledge that I gained from actually operating mobile. Uh, that there are areas uh, of town where I drive and I know I'm not going to hear any signals. There's just so much RF soup going on from plasma TVs or uh, point of sale cash registers or whatever else uh, that I know if I'm driving on North Pleasantburg Road by Cherrydale, no, that's not going to happen. However, Wade Hampton is a DX alley. That's a great place to make DX contacts from the car. Well, the same characteristic applies to neighborhoods as well. And so if you're looking for a new place to live, it's always a great idea to take along a portable radio or if you've got a mobile radio drive through the neighborhood and just make an assessment of uh, radio frequency noise. Um, we talked about high frequency terrain analysis. That can help you with the location. You can actually see uh, how your signals are going to propagate. Um, when we bought our uh, vacation home, that's where my ham station is, I did not do this. Uh, but I have run HFTA. I've got a great signal path, downward slope going toward Europe, good. Toward Africa, that's great. South America, I'm good. Australia, all right. Southeast Asia, uh, not so much. Sassafras Mountain is sitting there right in the way. And so for me to work into Thailand or even Japan for my location, it's difficult. So. Would I have made a different choice? Maybe, I don't know, but I didn't know about HFTA at that point. And here's a video, you can find radio frequency noise quickly. Uh, you can take a look at the link uh, when you get the handout. Um, just be aware that when you're, you're choosing a location, uh, that the noise and the train issues are really maybe more important than the kind of antenna that you choose. All right, now back to practical antennas. So here's our friend the dipole, the half-wave dipole antenna. Anybody remember the formula to calculate the distance in feet? 468. 468 divided by? Frequency in megahertz. Frequency in megahertz, exactly right. So when a dipole antenna is too short for a particular frequency, it's said to be capacitive. We talked about that earlier. And it relates to the ratio of voltage to current along the antenna. Uh, at that frequency. Uh, if its antenna is too long, it's said to be inductive, uh, again, due to that uh, voltage and current ratios. 
I just want to introduce these terms to you so that if you hear somebody talking about an inductive antenna, what they're saying, it's, it's just it's too long for that particular frequency. Now, there are antennas where you specifically put inductors in them. Uh, this would be an inductively loaded antenna. Here we have loading coils in both halves of a dipole. And what happens is that you can then make the antenna physically shorter. So you don't have room enough for a 260 foot long, 160 meter dipole. Well, if you put some loading inductors in it, well, maybe that 260 feet can go down to maybe 180 feet. But there's no free lunch. Because the full size dipole antenna will be a low Q antenna. But when you put loading elements, you raise the Q of the antenna. So the SWR bandwidth of that antenna will be much narrower. Um, trapped dipole antennas are multi-band antennas. They're, they're not actually doing any loading there, but what they're actually doing is, is allowing the antenna to work with different links on different frequencies. Uh, the traps serve as a resonant circuits or low-pass filters, uh, so that at the higher frequency, just the center part of the antenna is, act, uh, is active. You go down to the next band, and then the next section of the antenna is active. And finally, the lowest frequency, and the, the full size of the antenna is active. One thing about trapped antennas, though, they can radiate harmonics. And so, uh, whereas a, a standard dipole antenna is going to radiate mostly just on the one band that it's designed for. You may have heard about fan dipole antennas, also known as parallel dipole antennas, where you actually bring different dipole antenna links to a common feed point. Will this work? Yes. Is it recommended? Mm, they can be what I, call, what I call fiddly. They can be difficult depending on the height above ground um, and the links and to get them tuned up right. A lot of people uh, swear by them, though, so just be aware that fan dipoles are an alternative that you, you might utilize for a, a practical antenna. Folded dipole antennas, uh, again, it's a half wave in length, but you actually can use like 300 ohm twin lead uh, to make the antenna, and you short the ends so that you actually are forming a very thin full wave loop. Uh, and the feed point impedance is going to be on around 300 ohms as opposed to 500 ohms. So you're going to probably have to have a matching transformer uh, or some means of impedance matching in order to feed this antenna. But this is, this is something that um, is a popular antenna as well. G5RVs, uh, named after an amateur radio operator in England who, uh, uh, was it Varney? Can't think so, uh, who uh, designed uh, this antenna. Uh, it's uh, the basic G5RV, and there are different flavors, uh, is 102 feet long, and then it's fed with 34 feet of ladder line, which is then connected to any length of coax, which then goes back into the shack to an antenna tuner. An antenna tuner is required. Uh, it is said to be a multi-band dipole antenna. Um, I've not used them. Uh, I know some people like them, some people don't. So, but just to make you aware of a, a G5RV. Whew, there's something. You ever think about how these guys transmitted, you know, radio signals? They radiated, uh, they, uh, they, I'm sorry, they trailed an antenna out behind them and they fed it at the end. So it's a dipole antenna, but not fed in the center, but fed at the end, which is a high impedance point, high voltage, low current. Remember that ratio, voltage to current? And, and so uh, they had to, to feed it uh, using open wire ladder line, and current flowing into the antenna had to be um, equaled uh, with current flowing into a counterpoise or a ground. But you too can end fed a dipole antenna, and in fact, a lot of the summits on the air guys will will use these with nine to one balance uh, and and feed the end of a dipole. But this is known as a ZEP for the Zeppelin antenna. And then there's something called the extended double ZEP, uh, 
how would you like to double your power for free? What you do is you uh, have two 5 eighths wave elements. So the entire antenna is 1.25 wavelengths long. So it's a really long antenna. Um, and you feed it with ladder line at the center, and you have to use a tuner. But it gives you a 3 dB gain over a dipole antenna. So you can double your power just by building this extra big antenna. That's an extended double ZEP. We talked about vertical antennas. Uh, typically, they're a quarter wavelength high and use radials uh, to mirror uh, the, the vertical element down back into the ground. Uh, radials can be on the surface of the ground. They can be buried below the ground. Or they can be above the ground. They can be elevated over the ground. And there are a lot of studies that have been done that actually indicate that where um, a quarter wave vertical antenna with radials on the ground should have at least 30 to 40 radials uh, to, to give reasonable signal strength. If you elevate the radials, you may get by with just four. So I use this. I have a quarter wave vertical antenna for 40 meters, which is just a wire element shot up a tree. And I have four sloping elevated radials that actually come down to about you know, three feet above the ground. And the sloping radials actually raise the radiation resistance of the vertical antenna from its nominal 36 ohms up to close to 50 ohms uh, and works great. So this is something using elevated radials. Uh, um, vertical antennas can work very well. Now, if you don't have enough room for a quarter wave vertical antenna, and for example, 160 meters, that would be kind of difficult. So you can actually use shortened antennas. And antennas can be shortened by putting inductors, uh, for example, at the center of a vertical antenna, or by adding capacitance at the top, also known as a capacitance top hat. Um, and either of these techniques are both together can allow you to have an antenna uh, that is much shorter than uh, a quarter wavelength. For example, MFJ uh, sells a 160 meter vertical antenna that's only 33 feet tall. And they do it through a combination of inductive and capacitive loading. Now, what do you think that does to the bandwidth? Narrow. Pretty narrow, exactly right. And here's another view, loading coil. Uh, and the, ca the capacitive uh, top hat. Um, if you can use a capacitive top hat, then you can use a smaller coil, and that will give you greater radiation efficiency. So that's why the two are used in combination. And here also is another uh, example of uh, loading coils, uh, mobile antennas. Uh, this is a screwdriver antenna that can actually be varied using a motor so you can change the, the frequency to which it's tuned, which you really have to do because the Q of the antenna is so high. Uh, so every time you change frequencies, you're going to have to retune the antenna uh, in order to get a, a good impedance match. And the other thing is you'll see on these antennas is a lot of the conductors and connections and whatnot are really using uh, large gauge wire braid. Again, you're trying to reduce ohmic losses so you don't heat things up, rather you radiate energy. Okay, um, you can actually put two antennas together. Uh, and in doing so, you can actually get some increases in gain or some control over directionality. So that's why you'd want to use two antennas in, in concert with each other. And one thing that you may have to do, though, is control the signals that are going to each of the antennas uh, and their phase, the phase of the radio frequency signals. Um, in some applications, you want the signals to reach each of the antennas in phase with the same phase relationship. Um, in other cases, you may want to have them uh, with one antenna out of phase with the other. And you can do this by using calculated lengths of coaxial cable. 
And it can be as simple as using a T connector and uh, different lengths of coax. Now, in that case, you're going to have to use some sort of antenna tuner to make your transmitter happy. Uh, but you can find calculations for how to make phasing lines um, for particular applications. Another thing you can do is make up something called a Wilkinson divider, which I think is a more elegant solution. It uses different impedances of uh, either uh, coax or transmission line, um, or in the case of um, microwave frequencies, you can actually use a printed circuit board um, tracings. And what the Wilkinson divider does is maintains a constant input and output impedance. Uh, so you can feed it with 50 ohms and then have two 50 ohm outputs from a Wilkinson divider. So that's kind of a, a more elegant solution. And then you can vary the length of the cables from the Wilkinson divider to control phase. All right, this is on page 920 of your book, uh, diagram uh, 0343. Uh, came out a little crooked. Um, this is the, the bane of radio frequency engineers. Uh, and a lot of commercial broadcast stations uh, actually have multiple uh, towers and are directed by the FCC to create a directional pattern. Um, back when I was in college, I was the chief engineer of an AM radio station in Clare, Michigan, and uh, WCRM, which is no longer on the air. But it was a full 250 watts daytime on 990 kilohertz, and we had two towers. And since I had my FCC first class license, I could be the engineer of a directional AM antenna array. But you had to actually adjust it such that, and you had to go out and make field strength readings in the far field in order to confirm that your directional antennas were working properly. And we actually put a null towards Chicago because we had to protect WCFL, Chicago Federation of Labor, on one megahertz. We were at 990, they were at one megahertz, and our signal couldn't interfere with them. So that's why we had the directional array. So here, um, it, you can read in the book this chart, a lot of different patterns available uh, depending on the spacing of the antennas uh, and how they are being fed. We need to only worry about three. And we have an extra special handout for you that Dave created. So I'll give that to you after I do my little spiel here. That'll give you another bite at the apple. But out of all of these patterns, we have to, uh, we are concerned with three. Three cases. Um, and on this diagram, by the way, the, the, we're talking about two quarter wave vertical antennas and they're located on the vertical axis of these patterns. So just keep that in mind. So the first case are phased quarter wave vertical antennas. And when we have a horizontal dipole antenna, you remember the horizontal dipole, how, how long is it? It's a half wavelength, half wavelength dipole antenna. So Consider that, that's a half wavelength. Well, what if you put a vertical antenna and a vertical antenna, okay, they're now a half a wavelength apart, okay? So it's, it's kind of, you know, they're in the plane of the dipole. The dipole isn't there, but they're, they're a half wavelength apart. And if you feed them in phase so that they're receiving the radio frequency signal of exactly the same, you know, when the positive peak on one comes up, the positive peak on the other comes up, by feeding them in phase, it results in a figure eight pattern broadside to the axis of the, the two towers, or exactly like if there was a dipole antenna there. The major lobes are that way and that way. All right, so that's half wavelength apart, fed in phase. Each antenna is 50 ohms. Well, each antenna would, yes, be 50 ohm antennas. Yeah, the, well, and that's where a Wilkinson divider would allow you to match impedances so that you, or it's going to reduce the overall system impedance and you're going to have to use an antenna tuner uh, 
to match your, your transceiver to it. Yeah, there's, there's some engineering that, that goes into this. All right, but I want, so broadside to the axis of the two antennas, just like a dipole antenna, all right? That's in phase. If you take the same quarter wave verticals and feed one out of phase, then the magic happens. And you change the pattern, the figure eight pattern of the antennas from going this way to going this way. So you, you've got two quarter wave vertical antennas and you ha haven't rotated them or done anything, but with a flip of a switch, the flip of additional uh, phasing lines so that you change the phase of the feed to one of the antennas, you actually change the directionality of the system. So if you're going to put up you know, a couple of 160 meter quarter wave verticals, this is something you probably would want to incorporate. So you've got some directionality. So if the DX station is over there, you can, you can get them. So this is phased quarter wave verticals, again, a half wavelength apart, but fed out of phase. That changes uh, the, the axis of the figure eight. And then finally, if you have phased quarter wave verticals that are only a quarter of a wavelength apart and fed 90 degrees out of phase, then you get this pattern, a cardioid pattern. And the beauty of a cardioid pattern, and this is what we were, we were doing at WCRM in Clara, Michigan, is that cardioid null, in our case, was pointed right towards Chicago so that no signal would go down there and all the rest of it would go up into northern Michigan someplace. So those are the three cases. Half wavelength apart, fed in, pay, in phase, that's going to be like the, the, the dipole, fed out of phase, it's going to be 90 degrees, and then the quarter wave uh, fed 90 degrees out of phase, that's the cardioid pattern. So now, if we haven't confused you enough already, let me give you Dave's handout. And this will also be uh, for those um, uh, who are watching online, um, we'll have this in the, in the handouts and the link in the description. And Dave, you were saying that um, somebody was commenting that this is, this is the one question that if you're going to get wrong on the extra test, is typically the one. Well, we're trying to get you to 100%. So that's why we're taking a little time to, to give you this information. All right, moving on to just general long wire antennas and just a general concept. If you have a long wire antenna and you make it even longer, what happens is the lobes uh, of that antenna will actually go closer and closer to the wire or, or lower angle of radiation. So as a long wire antenna gets longer, the lobes align more closely with the direction of a wire. Just be aware of that fact. OCD. No, no, no. OCFD. We're not going to talk about obsessions here. Off center fed dipole. This is my favorite antenna, especially for the low frequency, longer wavelength bands, 160 meters, 80 meters. What you have is a half wave dipole antenna, but you feed it uh, at about the, the one third point, not at the center, but at the one third point. That has a nominal impedance there instead of being 73 ohms of around 200 ohms. And so you can get a four to one current ballon and put it at that four to one, four times 50 is 200. And then you can feed your dipole antenna. Um, so I have up right now a 260 foot long, 160 meter off center fed dipole antenna up about 65 feet. It works really well on 160 meters, but wait, there's more. It also works on even harmonics. So this 160 meter off center fed dipole antenna, which has a radiation pattern like a normal dipole antenna would, also works on 80 meters. 
and it has a kind of a clover leaf pattern where it has four lobes. But wait, there's more. It also works on 20 meters. And it also works on 10 meters. So it's a multi-band dipole antenna, the off-center fed dipole antenna that'll work on the, the frequency that you cut it to length for and then any even harmonics. And it works really well. So technically this is an off-center fed dipole. You'll hear some people refer to it as a Wyndham antenna. That's technically not correct because Wyndham antennas were fed with just a single wire. But it's so popular now. If somebody talks about a Wyndham, they may be talking about off-center fed dipoles. And the classic uh, is fed with a current ballon, four to one or six to one, uh, and um, this is what that looks like, fed with 50 ohm coax. Now, you'll also find another variation called the Carolina Wyndham antenna, which is an off-center fed dipole antenna um, using, though, a, a instead of a current ballon at the feed point, it uses something called a voltage ballon. And a voltage ballon is designed to uh, have equal amount of voltages on each side of the feed point. When that happens, it actually superimposes radio frequency current on the outer shield of the feed line. Well, the designer is using that, and you see that there's a 22-foot long vertical radiator coming down and that actually radiates in a Carolina Wyndham, and they have a, a current choke at the bottom of that that blocks any further radiation on the outer shield of the feed line. So you've got radiation both from the horizontal elements of the, the dipole and from that vertical. They say it fills in the, the, the pattern and makes it stronger. Just be aware, that's the difference between a, a conventional Wyndham off-center fed dipole and a Carolina window. Here's what you'd really like to have in your backyard. Unfortunately, you have to have a really big backyard to fit them in. Uh, but rhombic antennas, uh, 15 dB of forward gain. Uh, and you can actually have them open at the far end, or you can have them terminated. Uh, and um, for amateur radio use, you could use a, a dummy load, but for high power broadcast use, you actually have to use nichrome wire uh, that is spaced so you get a 50 ohm impedance and run enough nichrome wire down to then you can short it out and, and it'll dissipate half of the energy that you feed it. But that makes the antenna directional in one direction. So rhombic antennas with a terminator make it a single directional antenna. Without a terminator, it's a bi-directional. Satellite dish antennas, parabolic dish antennas, very high gain, uh, focuses energy to a feed point, uh, no, normally 50 dB over an isotropic radiator. So that's why parabolic antennas are used for very weak signal work at the UHF and above. An interesting phenomenon with a gain of parabolic uh, dish antenna is that as you double the frequency, the gain of the antenna goes up by 6 dB. So uh, an antenna that works effectively at a lower frequency will work even better at a higher frequency. And uh, Yagi antennas, uh, directional antenna, they're line linearly polarized, meaning that they're uh, horizontally radiating antennas. And I, I love this uh, animation, you can see uh, that this is a four element Yagi antenna and up close the pattern isn't uh, really uh, coherent but as it goes out in the far field uh, then uh, the outputs of the antennas are in phase and constructive. And can you use two Yagi antennas and have a circularly polarized antenna? Yes by mounting them perpendicular to each other and then feed them with phasing lines so that they're fed 90 degrees out of phase, you can then create a circularly polarized antenna which is useful for receiving amateur satellites. And my favorite receive antenna, named after Harold Beveridge of AT&T who invented it, it's a receive only antenna it's a traveling wave antenna. The antenna 
uh, is really a very long length of wire. Uh, the first one was nine miles long, but I have one on my property that's only 240 feet long, but it's terminated at the far end to ground. And what happens is that uh, the, the signal comes into the antenna and it actually builds the signal strength along the length of the antenna. And then you have a transformer uh, at the receive end um, and it receives only in one direction. So I have mine oriented toward Europe. And for 80 meters and 160 meters, I can hear signals coming from Europe on the beverage that I cannot hear on the 160 meter dipole. Because the beverage antennas are immune to noise. That's their claim to fame. Whereas a, a vertical antenna or a dipole antenna will pick up noise very well, the beverage doesn't. And so while its absolute output is, is lower, um, the noise isn't there, and so you can actually hear signals you wouldn't hear otherwise. Another way you can uh, receive uh, weak signals is using a receiving loop antenna. Uh, it's one or more turns of wire wound in the shape of a large open coil. And here, more turns on the coil or a larger coil form will give you more output. Uh, so bigger is better and more turns are better. And then there's a special flavor of this called the shielded loop antenna. It responds to magnetic fields. Uh, it's electrostatically balanced against ground and gives you uh, better nulls, so it's a directional uh, antenna, and it's directional in the plane of the loop, bi-directional, actually. And with a loop antenna system, especially those on aircraft, they're used a lot on aircraft, you can put a sense antenna, and what that does is that feeds into the loop antenna and makes it unidirectional. So if a plane is trying to find, for example, a directional beacon, um, you don't want it to be bidirectional or you might be flying away <laughs> from the beacon. Uh, so they add sense antennas to, to aircraft uh, loop antennas, and so you know which direction you're, tr you're traveling. And for radio direction finding, triangulation is used. Uh, we talked about this before in, in the tech class. Uh, you have two different receive locations where you can take bearings and then triangulate and determine where the transmitter is. And if you're doing direction finding, you have to make sure that you're working with the weakest signal possible. So something like this, a step attenuator, uh, can be used ahead of your receiver to reduce the signal down so you know you're, you're looking for uh, a weak signal, you're not uh, looking for something that's maybe overloading your, your, your receiver. And remember the antenna pattern we talked about earlier, the cardioid pattern? Uh, this also is useful for direction finding uh, when you actually have a, an antenna that you can turn. Um, and you can turn it toward uh, where you think the, the transmitter might be, and if you get a null, uh, then you know uh, it's in that direction. It's the absence of signal that can help you out. All right, I promise special treats, but first we have questions. Mm, excuse me. So what is the radiation pattern of two quarter wavelength vertical antennas spaced a half wavelength apart and fed 180 degrees out of phase? That's a figure eight along the axis of the array. And what is the radiation pattern of two quarter wave vertical antennas spaced a quarter wavelength apart and fed 90 degrees out of phase? That's, that's, now that's the special case. That's the cardioid pattern. They're only a quarter wavelength apart and fed 90 degrees. And what is the radiation pattern of two quarter wavelength vertical antennas spaced half wavelength apart and fed in phase? That's broadside to the, the axis, right? All right. What happens to the radiation pattern of an unterminated long wire antenna as the wire length is increased? 
I heard it. Did I hear A? B. The lobes align more in the direction of the wire as the wire length is lengthened. And what is an OCFD antenna? Yep, you didn't have to read very far. It's a dipole fed approximately a third way from one end with a fair four to one current balance. And what is the effect of a terminating resistor on a rhombic antenna? I didn't specifically say with the case of a beverage, uh, this is rhombic though, yeah. So, uh, yeah, changes the radiation pattern from bidirectional to unidirectional. Yeah. So what is the approximate feed point impedance at the center of a two wire folded dipole antenna? It's made with twin lead and can be fed with twin lead. So it's 300 ohms, yeah. And what is a folded dipole antenna? It's a dipole constructed from, as it turns out, one wavelength. It's a very thin loop. And what is a G5RV? It's a complicated thing. It's a multiband dipole uh, fed with coax and a selected length of open wire transmission line. So, yeah. And which of the following describes a ZEP? It's an end fed dipole antenna. And which of the following describes an extended double ZEP? That's a center fed one and a quarter wavelength long antenna. Yes, indeed. 3 dB of gain over a dipole. And how does the gain of an ideal parabolic dish antenna change when the operating frequency is doubled? So here we're talking about satellite dish antennas. If you double the operating frequency, gain will go up by 6 dB. And how can linearly polarized Yagi antennas be used to produce a circular polarization? They've got to be two Yagis perpendicular to each other and fed 90 degrees out of phase. Yeah. And where should a high Q loading coil be placed to minimize losses in a shortened vertical antenna? near the center of the vertical radiator, correct. And why should an HF mobile antenna uh, loading coil have a high ratio of reactance to resistance? It minimizes losses because you want to have low ohmic resistance. That's the kind of resistance they're talking about here. And what is a disadvantage of using a multiband trapped antenna? It might radiate harmonics. And what happens to the bandwidth of an antenna as it is shortened through the use of loading coils? The bandwidth decreases. And what is an advantage of using top loading in a shortened HF vertical antenna? You have to think about this. What we're talking about here, top loading, that's that capacitive top hat. And if you add that capacitance, you can make the loading coil in the center smaller. And by making that loading coil smaller, you reduce the ohmic resistance, which ultimately improves radiation efficiency. Long way around the barn. And what is the function of a loading coil used as part of an HF mobile antenna? It actually, if an antenna is too short, it's called capacitive. So the antenna, really short antenna, uh, needs inductive reactants to cancel that out. And what happens to feed point impedance at the base of a fixed-length HF mobile antenna as the frequency of operation is lowered? Mm 
So as the frequency of operation is lowered, is the antenna going to be more inductive or look more capacitive? So it's going to look more capacitive. Um, and um, is its radiation ability going to be probably, since you're moving away maybe from a resonant uh, frequency, so the radiation resistance decreases and the capacitive reactance increases when the frequency is lowered. Gonna have to work on that one. And what is the primary purpose of a phasing line when used with an antenna having multiple driven elements? It ensures that each driven element operates in concert with the others. Yeah. And what is the use for a Wilkinson divider? Yeah. That it's used to d divide power equally uh, and maintain 50 ohm input and output impedances. And when constructing a beverage antenna, which of the following factors should be included in the design to achieve good performance at the desired frequency? You want it to be as long as possible, so it should be one or more wavelengths long. And which is generally true for low band receiving antennas? It's, this isn't obvious, but what did I say that a beverage antenna uh, is immune to noise? Um, so you don't care. Actually, a beverage antenna has negative gain. A beverage antenna does not have the gain of a dipole antenna. However, since it's immune to noise, it doesn't matter. Um, so even though its gain is less, its immunity to noise, um, uh, which would impact, adversely impact a dipole, for example, uh, doesn't impact it, so it's not important. And what is an advantage of using a shielded loop antenna for direction finding? I said that it's electrostatically balanced against ground. It gives really strong nulls in the plane of the loop. And what is the main drawback of a wire loop antenna for direction finding? It is bi-directional. Wire loop antennas by themselves are bi-directional. What can you add? A sense antenna. That makes it unidirectional. So what is the triangulation method of direction finding? Antenna headings from several receiving locations are used to locate the signal source. And why is it advisable to use an RF attenuator on a receiver being used for direction finding? It prevents receiver overload, the ALC or AGC from working, yeah. And what is the function of a sense antenna? So you could use this in conjunction with a loop antenna to modify the pattern to provide a null in only one direction. So it's no longer bi-directional. And which of the following describes the construction of a receiving loop antenna? Yep. One or more turns of wire wound in the shape of a large open coil. And how can the output voltage of a multiple turn receiving loop antenna be increased? Bigger is better, more turns are better. And what characteristic of a cardioid pattern antenna is useful for direction finding? A very sharp single null. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of chapter nine, part one, but here's the special treats I promised. On YouTube,
there is a gentleman, a, a physicist, uh, Eugene Kurtyansky. I hope I pronounced that correct. Um, he has the physics uh, YouTube channel with many, many videos on all sorts of uh, physics areas, uh, speed of light, space time, but a lot of electronics animations as well. So uh, two that I'll recommend, this is one on transmission lines and transmission line reflections, uh, and another on grounding and shielding, uh, shows you in animated form why it all works. And so I'll be sending you links and emails, uh, and we'll have this uh, handout in the uh, uh, video description box on YouTube for folks. Uh, so highly recommend uh, Dr. Kurtyansky's uh, YouTube channel. It really illuminates a lot of information. And then from Ham Radio Now, uh, from uh, number 199, there's the episode Standing Up for Standing Waves. If you've never seen this, it's about a 40 minute presentation uh, that actually uh, utilizes a two meter VHF transceiver, open wire transmission line, antennas, field strength, and actually physically demonstrates in a, in a setting uh, how transmission line, how VSWR is measured, uh, how everything works. So, highly recommended. So, keep calm and go home. Thanks so much.